welcome to a 12 part series of redigging of the wells of anointing teachings. I also want to inform you that my books are now available on Amazon. You can get them online on Amazon. You can use the www.amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Steve Wayesu ebooks, paperback and even hardcover books. Welcome to this series, Redigging of the Wells of Anointing. Thank you. I want to use one man in the Bible to describe, you know, you know, if I use the heart of Jesus, we'd be like, but that is God. I want to use a human being. And I want us to understand why God calls that human being a man after this sacred heart of God. I want us to look at David. He's a human being, weak like you and me. We know he committed adultery. We know he killed. And we like relating to him in that point. Even David killed. Even David committed adultery. Ask your neighbor how many times? <laughs> the Bible says David, after repenting, he never again, never, he never again committed that sin. Never. Only once. And they keep singing. Even David was adulterous. Once. Repented and never did it again. If God was to condemn you for the sins that you already confessed, we we'll don't be dead. But you confess and God has forgotten. Well, remember that one of the one, and he never repeated. So I want us to look at the life of David and understand why God says he's a man after God's heart. A man after God's heart. He has so many qualities. But I just want to look at about uh, at about uh, four qualities of David. Among the many, four qualities of David that make God say is a man after God's heart. And as I'm teaching these four qualities, my prayer is for you and me. <laughs> May the grace of God come and give us this quality. So that we can truly be after God's heart. The first quality that I want to talk about David, let me start with love. David is very loving. I'm not saying that because he has many wives. I'm not talking about that angle. Because he has many wives. No. Many wives was actually an error. Moses error. Moses made that small slip of the tongue. By allowing the Jews to divorce their wives and to marry many wives. That was not in the plan of God. And Jesus comes to confirm it was not in the plan of God in Matthew chapter 19 from verse 4. When Jesus says, if you divorce your wife and you take another one, you commit adultery. And the Pharisees were, Matthew 19 from verse 4. And the Pharisees were asking him, but how comes Moses allowed us? To marry many wives. Matthew 19 from verse 4. How has Moses allowed us to give divorce tickets to our wives and marry many wives? Jesus explained, Moses did that because of the hardness of their heart, but it was never the plan of God from the beginning. Amen. And Jesus corrected that mistake. 
And he said, from now on, whoever divorces his wife or husband takes another person is committing adultery. So he rectified the error. But when the error was there, from the time Moses allowed, because God had put him as a leader, when a leader makes a mistake and God has put him as a leader, and the people follow because the leader has already approved, without the people knowing, that mistake is not on the people. It was no longer a sin to give divorce. It was no longer a sin to marry many wives until Jesus corrected. From that day, it's a sin if you commit it. So God owned the mistake until he corrected. And that's one of the reasons that we need to understand who the church is. Jesus gave the keys to Petro. And he told him whatever he passed on earth is passed in heaven. And that's why the church is never quick to make decisions. The church is very slow. To make, because they have to look at all the pillars of our faith before <laughs> proclaiming or pronouncing a decision. And if they pronounce a wrong decision, for example, God will own the mistake. If you follow as a Christian, it will not be a sin. Because the leader who God told you to obey the leaders is the one who told you to do that. I'm not talking at any level. For the Catholic Church, I'm not talking about the priest telling you do something which is wrong and you do say, God says that way. No. I'm talking about when officially the church, through the structure from the ground, parish, there was, until the Pope and the College of Bishops, they sit down and say, this is wrong, this is right. When it's proclaimed there, the heavens have approved, or they have blocked that. So I'm not talking about, I tell you something, now I say, but you told me to obey. If I tell you to see now, you are, you are, you are telling me no. It is against the word of God. And the church will not proclaim something that is going against the word of God. God will not allow it. But a small error can happen. We are humans, and God can allow it to happen. Because God could have told Moses, he used to talk to Moses face to face. He could have told Moses, Moses, that one, no, don't allow. But he allowed the mistake. Or wasn't God there when Moses was doing that? He was there. But he allowed it for a reason, maybe to come and teach us about the ways of God. But later he said, any person who marries many wives or gives divorce, that is sin now. He said it is one man, one woman. So let me go back to David. So the fact that he had many wives is not a sin, because that time it was accepted in the kingdom of God. But now I'm talking about David as being a man of love. David as a man who knows what is in the heart of God, in that sacred heart of God, and is trying to live that love of God. I mentioned John 15, 13, where the Bible says there's no greater love than the one who's ready to die for his friends. Let's look at David and we compare ourselves to David. Let's compare the heart of David and your heart and my heart. David is a, is a husband. He's looking after his father's sheep and goods. He loves his father. He loves the work he's given. And he knows if one sheep does not go back home, the father will be angry. So he took care of the sheep with all love. And when the sheep was in danger, David was ready to die, but not the sheep to go. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I know their voice and they know my voice. He says, a hired shepherd, when he's hired, he receives danger, what does he do? He runs away. But the good shepherd is ready to lay his life for the sheep. That is Jesus and that is David. So you can see the heart of Jesus, like we have, and the heart of David. When the lion is coming, you just imagine it, if a lion was to enter here. <laughs> maybe, maybe the hungry lion that I see everywhere, hungry lion, hungry lion. God is good. I've seen some are pointing and they'll actually make a hole of it. <laughs> if a lion was to come here, Ask your neighbor, would Jesus still be Lord? <laughs> <laughs> now I want you to 
to compare your heart and the heart of David. Then you understand what God is saying, he's a man after God's own heart. When the lion is coming, David does not run away. David knows as long as I'm on the side of God, if you allow the Holy Spirit to transform you, to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and that's the point you can say, I am not under the law, I am under grace. Amen. People use it, but they don't mean it. We are not under the law, we are under grace. Do you know the meaning? Being under, being under grace and not under the law, it basically means you are living, you are being controlled by the Spirit of God, you are bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and when you are bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, no law can convict you. If you are too loving, you are too kind, you are too patient, you are too persevering, you are too peaceful, you are too humble, you are too obedient, you are too self-controlled, which law can harm you? None. Not in Zambia, not in Kenya, not in America, not in China, and not the heavenly law. That's why you are under grace and not under the law. That's the meaning. But not when you are committing sin and saying we are not under the law. You are under the law. If you are committing sin, no. Are we still together? Yes. David, when he sees the lion coming, a man after God's heart, whose heart has been touched by God, that he knows his God is able, he's the God of the impossible. Is a God who can work miracles at any time. Instead of looking at the lion and running away, he says, I have to protect the sheep like the good shepherd, Jesus, the sacred heart of God, who's ready to die in your place. David is in this saying, I am ready to die, but not the sheep. I would rather die and not go back to my father than go back to my father minus one sheep. But he, he does not stop at that. He knows there's a living God. What does he do? He starts praising his God. His life was full of praises. Look at the Psalms. He's just praising God all the time. And that is the first chapter of my book, Maturing in the Holy Spirit. The first chapter says, if you want to mature in the Spirit of God, you must have a thankful heart. If you don't have a thankful heart, you're a grown-up baby. The body is big, but the spirit is still baby. But when you become mature in the spirit, you move away from the complainer's club. Ask your neighbor, which club do you belong to? <laughs> God is good. David is not in the complainer's club. He starts now praising God. The lion is coming. Instead of running away, and the sheep is there, he starts saying, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who made the road in the Red Sea. The God who rained manna from heaven bread. The God who brought water forth from the rock. The God who brought even meat in the wilderness. The God who never defeated. You've never been defeated, you will never be defeated. Then he looks at the Lord and says, God, will this one defeat you? If you are God, would you accept the Lord to defeat David? No. Tell your neighbor, that's why he was not defeated. Because <laughs> God is challenged by, by, by the thanksgiving, by the praises. If you learn how to praise your parent, mommy, there's no mommy like you. Daddy, you're the best. Look at that boy the day he wanted to beat me. You just gave him one eye and the boy took off. And your father is feeling elated. Remember the shoe you bought me? Thank you, Papa. You pay my school with thank you. The child is always thanking you. After thanking you, Papa, and then he says, Daddy, I saw a bicycle today. <laughs> Even if you don't have money, I will tell him, son, I look for the money. <laughs> True or false? True. You get energized. <coughs> and that is the heart of God. And that is the heart that David had. That's why David never lost any battle. He never lost any battle because he had the heart of God, ready to die. But at the same time, he knows, I have the living God on my side. And God says, really, with all that pampering, with all that praises, he releases power upon David. A young boy, maybe younger than everybody who's here, 
takes the lion by the hand and tears it. Would you like that kind of grace? Yes. You have to seek your heart to be like the heart of Christ. The sacred heart of Jesus. You have to allow the heart of God to kiss your heart, to be one with God. You have to allow it to be in this temple, to live in you. So he can give you that kind of courage and that kind of grace. Instead of the sheep dying, he kissed a lion. He was ready to die, but God gave him the grace of defeating the enemy. David could have confidently used the words that we wrongly use by saying, the one in me is stronger. We normally use that word, ask your neighbor, who's in you? <laughs> Maybe you're full of anger. Maybe you're full of jealousy. Maybe you're full of lust. Maybe you're, and you're saying the word, and the devil is just loving you. Say, Don't think of that, I'm the one in you. <laughs> so if you want to use those words, the one in me, you must seek your heart to be like the sacred heart of Jesus. That's what David. That's why God calls him a man after God's heart. Let me tell you this. You will never defeat a challenge by faith and your faith level remains the same. If you face a challenge and you trust God and you overcome the challenge by trusting God, your faith goes to another level. After David killing the lion, do you think his faith remained the same? No. It was at another level. It can never remain the same. When you complain and complain and complain about the challenge that you're facing now, your faith is not growing. It could actually be going down instead of going up. But David, the level of his faith went up. He went home happy. Told the daddy everything is okay. The daddy was happy, an obedient boy. The following day, he goes to look after the sheep. Now, today, he sees a bear, a bear coming. Now, let me ask you. Yesterday, you killed a lion. Are you going to run away from a bear? No. He'll be like, what is this? Because he has already faced a bigger challenge and overcome by faith, he can trust God to be able to overcome this challenge of today. When you overcome a challenge today by faith, when tomorrow a smaller challenge comes, you just laugh. Not complaining. So you just say, yesterday God helped me to defeat a bigger one. Who are you? That is David. He trusted God yesterday, killed a lion. So today the bear comes and says, you're, you're in trouble. My God is big. <laughs> he takes the bear by the hand, destroys it. All that time, God is using the circumstances around David to prepare him for bigger battles. What you've been complaining about, the challenges that you're going through, God is preparing for something big. Instead of accepting and learning and moving forward, you've been complaining, you lose the battle and the lesson. The following day, the father tells him, today, you're not going to look after cattle. Today, you're going to take food to your brothers. <laughs> The obedient David takes the food. Wherever God sends you, that's where the mission is. He goes innocently with the food. He arrives and finds the mighty Israeli army in one corner, almost peeing on themselves because of one Goliath. Including his brothers. Remember, David is son number eight. The seven brothers are in the Israeli army, the army of the Lord. Prestigious. There was no better job than being in the army of the Lord. No better job. At that time, being in the army of the Lord meant everything. If only Christians can understand that we are in the army of the Lord. If only we can understand how prestigious it's meant to be. David was disadvantaged looking after the sheep. You could be disadvantaged whatever you are doing. But maybe a big trained to be greater than the army of the Lord. In that disadvantage, the lion, the bears, he comes and meets the army of the Lord full of fear because they, they, they don't know what is in the heart of God. They don't have the sacred heart of God in themselves. They've not allowed God to be part of their lives. 
And David is asking, Why? What is going on? And they are showing him that Goliath. You know, for them, they are seeing a giant. When David looks, he sees, That man is too big, I cannot miss. <laughs> He's too big to miss. But he is seeing a giant. He is seeing, ah, If he was thinner, maybe I can miss. But, but that I cannot miss. So he's looking at things from a different point of view. The brothers tell him, you, you small boy, you go back home. Go look after the sheep. The boy, people hear what he's saying. They run to the king and they tell him, there is a boy here. He say he can take on Goliath. The king says, boy, bring him. The boy goes. The king looks, he laughs. This one, it will be like a, a, an appetizer for Goliath. <laughs> And the boy is telling him, King, my Lord. Ask your neighbor, is the God of David the same God as yours, or your God is different? <laughs> David tells the king, my God has favored me. It's all favor, we don't deserve Everything you have is favor. His grace. My God has favored me. I have destroyed lions with my own heart and bears. The king looks at the boy. He doesn't turn up. The boy insists. I'm sure the king in his heart says, ah, Let's sacrifice him. Stop him. Stop him. The boy puts on the, 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 the fighting garments. It can't work. It's too heavy for him. Say, King, I'm not used to this. I'm used to a different playing ground. The king says, okay, go. The young boy picks five small stones. He's going to fight against a giant and a sling. And when he's going towards Goliath, Goliath looks at him and says, young boy. He looks like the army of the Lord, all they could find is a boy. And you're carrying a stick. Do you think I'm a dog that you beat me with a stick? David answered and said, You are coming to me with all the armor. You are coming to me with the shield and the spear and the helmet and the boots and everything. I don't have all that. But I come to you with only one thing. I come in the name of the Lord. Only. All that David had was the name of the Lord. The God of the Israeli army. And we know we are told in the Bible that when we mention the name of Jesus, every knee bows in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Right now, we are mentioning Jesus, even the demons are bowing. Yet we still fear Jesus. Is that name also yours, or that name is for Steve and David? <laughs> then why do we fear? Why do we fear? David says, you are coming with all the army, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, the God of hosts. And Goliath takes a spear, whatever. David takes a sling. Throws. I want to believe that David was in real. He used the strength of a boy. And the strength of a boy cannot kill a giant. Even if it's the giant, the giant will just have felt like a fly. But I want to believe because David trusted God. When he threw the stone, the Holy Spirit power took over at the speed and aimed. Pah! The giant. Now, David ran with his own strength now to where the giant is, took the sword, which was too heavy for him, carrying the sword and twat, disconnected the head. And all the cowards, <laughs> all the cowards, they started, there's no God like me. That is. <laughs> Ask your neighbor. Are you a David or you among the cowards? <laughs> God is good. Amen. That is David, trusting God, even in 
the midst of a storm. That is the heart of God. Even in the midst of a storm, he's ready to die of Goliath, but not let his God be humiliated. <coughs> At what? Are you ready to compromise? Or are you ready to die for your faith? Do you love God? You know, you know, how do you respond to the love of God? Responding. Someone you love you unto death. Are you ready to love him unto death? Yes. Are you ready to love as Jesus loves? That is the question today. That is the sacred heart of God. Being ready to love even unto death. That was David. So when God is saying a man after God's heart, don't look at it so simply. He's an adulterer, he murdered. Uh -uh. It is deep and white. When you look at his love, it's amazing. Ready to die when lions come. Ready to die when the, the, the bears are coming. Ready to die before Goliath and everything else. Ready to die. And even when he has the opportunity of killing his enemies, like Saul, the king, when he wanted to kill him, David does not kill the anointed of God. He still respects the anointed. He respects the will of God. That is the heart of God. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my father. David could not touch the anointed of God because his food is to do the will of the father. The heart of God. So if you really want to have the heart of Christ, the sacred heart, number one, you have to love as Jesus loves. You have to love as Jesus loves. So as I'm teaching, in your heart be praying for the grace to love as Jesus loves. Not the fake love of this world, the love that many girls are crying, impregnated and left. They thought it was love. The love that many marriages are breaking because partners are cheating each other. That is not love. It is lust and looking for money and the treasure of this world. That is not love. So we need to love as we have to love. That is one of the qualities of King David. That's why he's a man after the sacred heart of Christ. The second quality connected to love is commitment. 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 David was committedly committed to whatever cause that God put him to. Committedly committed. When he saw go look after the cattle, after the sheep, he goes and is committed. Even if he has to die, he has to protect it. When he saw go to your brother's take food, committed and is ready to die. Even though he's committed even in life. You know, commitment. How committed are you in your Christianity? How committed are you to Christ will tell you if your heart is close to the heart, sacred heart, or it is far away from the sacred heart of Jesus. Your commitment. When you took the vows of baptism, I reject Satan and all his ways and his sins. I reject everything. I reject witchcraft. How committed are you to those vows? When you vow before God, I'll take you, Maria, to be my wife. In goodness, in badness, in riches, in poverty, in health, in sickness, until death. How committed am I to that vow? How committed are you to your vow? Will tell you if your heart is close at the heart of God or is far away. Commitment. The best example I can give of commitment, I love talking about, uh, you know this sandwich? that they call egg and ham sandwich. An egg and a ham, eh? In the bread. Egg and ham sandwich. When you look at the egg and ham sandwich, there are two main parties that are involved in that meal, as we like enjoying it. There is a hen and there is a pig. For you to eat an egg and ham sandwich. The egg, in this case, lays the egg and goes on in this beautiful So the hen is involved in this meal. 
The hen is involved. You are eating the egg. But the hen is doing its other business. But for you to eat the ham, the pig is committed. The pig must. The, the hen is involved. The pig is committed. Its whole life is there. Ask your neighbor, in your Christianity, are you involved or are you committed? <laughs> what did they say? Committed. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Do you think God in your life is involved or committed? Committed. Constantly committed. That's why the Bible keeps saying the constant love of God. Constant is forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that those who believe in him will not believe but have everlasting life. Committed to your eternity. God is totally committed to your eternity. Ask your neighbor, are you committed to your eternity yourself? Are you committed to your eternity? Can you imagine some of us alone? God is committed, he wants you to live forever. But some of us don't want to live forever. Because of the allurance of this world, because of their small fun, because of party after party, because of a few drinking, because of a few things of the world. That's why you go to which doctor to get a little money. Ask your neighbor, how much more can you carry with that? <laughs> Are we committed? That is the question. David was committedly committed. Whatever work is given is committed. Ready to die for the sheep of the Father. At your workplace, where you're employed and you sign an agreement, are you committed to that agreement? Or when your boss goes, you say, oh, my boss is not seeing me. You steal the time, you steal the material, and the boss up there, the CCTV is just watching. <laughs> Are you committed or just involved? So if you really want to penetrate the sacred heart of God, if you want to experience this goodness, this infinite mercy of God, you have to be committed to the cause. Whether you've been employed to wash a toilet, wash it until the angels are clapping. Committed to that cause. Whether the boss is watching or not, we need to be a committed people. By the way, God wants committed people. And if you don't know that even devil worshippers, the first quality they look for is commitment. <laughs> that is the first quality. They don't care whether you're a Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, or a pagan. If you are totally committed to paganism, they'll take you. If you are totally committed to Catholicity, they'll take you. If you are totally committed to making money, they'll take you. They are looking for quality among commitment. Then they'll take your commitment and drive it in their direction. That's what they do. They'll not reject you because you're a Catholic. They'll not reject you because you're receiving the Eucharist. No. If you are committed, they'll take you. Slowly, slowly, they start initiating you without knowing. They'll give you money, and you're going up the ladder. You're signing contract. Before you know, you have signed commitment on the other side. And now they tell you, where you have reached, you cannot go back. We want the blood of your cousin, your mother, your uncle. You start paying now the hard way, because you committed yourself there. And they tell you, you don't bring their blood, it is your blood. You're already in the trap, just because of kwacha, which you will never carry. So the first thing that God wants if you're a Christian is to be committed to your Christianity. And that's when you'll be after the sacred heart of Christ. Commitment. Point number three for David. Point number three. We've dealt with the love and commitment. The other point of David is humility. 
David is very humble. Just like Moses. We say Numbers 12, 3 says, Moses was the humblest person on the face of the earth. David is very humble. Though a king, though a king, he is very humble. Who's a humble person? A person who's ready to say, I'm sorry, please excuse me, thank you. From the heart is a humble person. But if you cannot say, I am sorry when I make a mistake, you are very proud. People who are proud can't calm down. They cannot calm down and say, I am sorry. Yet we all make mistakes. Do we own up or do we justify? A person who justifies a mistake is a very proud person. And pride is of the devil. Pride is of the devil. So really to be humble, you have to be ready to go. Even in marriage, marriage cannot work unless there's humility. You know, when you look at the word understand, understand. For there to be understanding, we must go under for us to stand. There are two words. Understand. Go under for you to stand. Go under for your marriage to stand. Humble yourself for your marriage to stand. For the relationship to last. Understand. So look at baby. I want to go to the only sin that he committed that time. The sin of fornication and adultery. He committed only once. The Bible is so clear. He never did it again. After committing this sin of adultery and fornication, when you read 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 18, you read it later, I'll just tell you the story. I'm being fast because of time. When we read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 18, you're going to see when the prophet Nathan was sent to King David. <coughs> he came to David and enlightened him. The word of God is meant to enlighten us just like prophet Nathan <coughs> enlightened David. So the word of God today is enlightening us just like it happened for King David. And that is the purpose of the word of God. When the prophet is going to hear, he's going to speak the word of God so that he can be enlightened. What matters is after enlightenment, what do you do? That makes a difference in terms of your commitment and your loving God. So the, the prophet comes and tells David the famous story of the two people. One very rich, the other very poor. The rich man had a lot of goods, <coughs> a lot of animals, livestock. But the poor man, the Bible says, had only one small sheep. One. Small. And he loved it so much because he didn't have another. Wherever he was putting food for his children, the Bible says, he added another plate for this cashew. He would carry it on his bosom because he loved it. He didn't have another. But the Bible says one day, the prophet is telling King David, the rich man had visitors. He decided to slaughter a sheep for a goat. Instead of taking from his many flock, he decides to go to the poor man who has one and takes it away from him and slaughters for his visitors. When David had that, the Bible says he was enraged. He was angry. And he said that man must die. He must die. The people of Zambia, should the man die or not? <laughs> die. Die. <laughs> there are some people, if you are God, you will be in trouble. You will be in trouble today. <laughs> The king said, that man must die. And pay how many times? Four times. I always wonder, how was he going to pay after dying? <laughs> king David knows. And then the prophet looks at King David and tells him what? That man is you. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, that person is you. That person is you. King David had committed a sin, covered it, killed the soldier, knowing that now the secret is finished. Nobody knows it. Remember, he's a man after God's heart. But he's committed adultery. 
After that, he's killed as any human being would do. He's covered the sin the way we cover our sins. And he lived as though he did not sin. How many times do we sin and we cover it? How many sins right now are you covering and you know you committed, but you read them in your subconscious, you are living as if you are very holy? Body of Christ, Father, bring them. <laughs> How many sins are we hiding and you are very, very saved? I got saved in 1900. We are not under the law. And you're breaking the law every day. That's not the meaning of not under the law. That's not what St. Paul meant. So we are hiding many sins, but because nobody else knows it, we are like, it is okay. You know, that husband of somebody, or somebody's wife, went to the Lord Jane, and you are okay because nobody, even telling us, nobody saw us. Tell your neighbor, even God did not see you. <laughs> <laughs> and you are living comfortably. I have never been discovered. Tell your neighbor, today you will be discovered like in David. <laughs> God is good. Oh, David was living like you and me. But now the difference is, when the prophet told him, that man is you. You took Uriah's wife, you slept with her, committed adultery, you killed the soldier. David sincerely repented. That is the difference. Sincerely. The Bible says, when you read this, those verses I've given you, for one week, he left the king's bed, the state house bed, he slept on the floor one week. Can you imagine your president? Or my, my president, Uru Kenyatta. He leaves the state house bed and sleeps on the floor because he's sorry for what he has done. A president. For that one week, he never took even water. He did not eat any food. Sincerely sorry. One week, fasting, praying, sleeping on the floor. One week. Sincere repentance, telling God, I'm so sorry. You, when you commit a sin, what do you do? <laughs> Some of us, we are so angry, we go to the hungry lion, we say, bring chips and chicken. <laughs> Have you ever fasted because of your sins? No. We normally fast so that you get a car. We normally fast so that you get a house. Have you ever fasted? Took three days to fast because of your sinfulness? No. That's the difference between your heart and my heart and the heart of King David. He fasted one week. Sincerely sorry. Telling God, I'm sorry. And that is the time he sang Psalms 51. In that sorrow is when he sings Psalms 51. And verse 11, in some Bibles, verse 13, he's saying the famous words, Do not cast me away from you, Lord. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. When the Holy Spirit is taken away from you, you cannot bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You don't know the heart of God. You don't know the suffering, sacred heart of Christ. Your heart is only attached to the heart of Christ, the sacred heart of Christ, when the Holy Spirit is the one who's leading your life. When you are bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that's when you are attached to the heart of Christ. David is telling God, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Remember his soul, King Saul, who was there before him, the Holy Spirit was taken away after having pride and disobedience. Now he's disobeyed God, he's become proud, he's even covered in the sin, pretending it is not there. And he knows the Holy Spirit will go. And when the Holy Spirit goes, you lose power and authority of heaven. When the Holy Spirit leaves you, you are rejected as a Christian. Romans 8, 9 says, whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ is not 
of Christ. He's not a Christian. Romans 8, 9. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ is not a Christian. And it says, if the Holy Spirit is in us, in the same Romans 8, 9, if truly the Holy Spirit is in you and me, we will not be led by the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. We will have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We will be having the heart of Christ. If it's in us, our actions will tell. If the Holy Spirit is in you and me, our behavior will tell. So you don't need to wonder so much, do I have the Holy Spirit or not? Just look at your behavior, you know. <laughs> Can you close your eyes for one minute? Inside, in your heart, look at your behavior. Hey, mama, close your eyes. Look at this. You know when you're looking at you, you cannot focus on it. Hey, close your eyes. I want you to look at your inside, your inside, your inside. Look at your inside. Look at your heart. Mama, close your eyes. Hey, people, it's not that they don't like closing their eyes. Mama, close your eyes. Look at your life and tell yourself the truth. The kind of life you are living, do you think you still have the Holy Spirit? Or he could have left you like he left you Saul and was about to leave King David? Are you being truly led by the Spirit of God, or are you being led by the flesh? You know, the flesh is not the physical body. The flesh is a part of the human being that makes you want to sin. That is the flesh. The body is not you. Maybe Jesus had a body. The issue is not the body. The flesh is that part of you that leads you to sin. If you are being pushed by that part to commit sin, possibly the Holy Spirit left you. And we need to pray to God if the Holy Spirit left us to forgive us today and for the Holy Spirit to come back into our lives. In your heart, you can say, Come, Holy Spirit. Invite him in your heart once more. God says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. In your heart, you can invite the Holy Spirit. Always invite him. But remember, he'll come if you are in the wells of anointing, <coughs> redeeming the body, his temple, removing everything that is evil, every garbage, every stone that is there. That is the only time you'll come back in. Remember, he's holy. That's why it's called the Holy Spirit. If you want him to come in, you have to prepare the place where he's going to come in, your temple. That's the purpose of which Jesus died. Lord, help us to be humble like in David. To say we are sorry. He even lies on the floor for a whole week. Sincerely repentant for his sinfulness. He did not eat for the whole week. Fasting. Because he realized that he was so sinful. And God, you are merciful. You are merciful to him. You did not believe him. You forgave him. And we call you Jesus, the son of David. The man who committed that sin and never repeated again. Because he sincerely repented. Give us the heart, God, to sincerely repent and not go back to our old ways. And we'll be like in David, a man, women after God's heart, ladies after God's heart, the youth after God's heart, husband and wives after God's heart, and children after God's heart, like in David. He repented and then went back. May we repent of our sinfulness, God, and never go back to our sinful ways, especially intentionally, not to go back intentionally. So help us, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Love for Jesus. So David was so humble. He is able to say, I am sorry God I'm wrong, after realizing his mistake. Your humility will depend with, I know the Holy Spirit is reminding you so much as you are feeling. What are you going to do after this? That is what God is going to be looking at. Are you going to continue saying, I don't care? Or are you going to humble yourself and return to the ways of God? That will tell you if you are really seeking the heart of God, or the flesh is ruling your life. And it's a choice. It's a choice. God does not force. God is so humble and gentle. 
He does not fault. He's at the door of every heart here, knocking, <coughs> saying, I wish today don't harden your hearts. Can you imagine God is wishing? God is wishing we don't harden our hearts. The most powerful, the almighty God, who can just penetrate our heart, poop, but he's actually saying, I'm at the door knocking. Harden not your hearts. And the fourth quality I want to look about David, and I want to finish that one. Then we have uh, prayers before the break, and then we'll continue later. The fourth point I want to look at who David is, is that element of obedience. Humility and obedience, they go together. They are like brother and sister. And the opposite is also true. Pride and disobedience, they go together. The moment you are proud, you'll fall. The devil was so proud, he was kicked from heaven. Because pride gives birth to disobedience. You know, what is pride? Pride is, you know, this, this is the boundary. You've been told, don't get out of this square. And you know. But you say, even though I know, I'll jump out. That is pride. You know you're not meant to jump. You're a schoolgirl, a schoolboy. You know this is the fence. We are not supposed to go outside. But you still jump out of the fence. You are proud. And you already disobey. Pride made you disobey. So wherever you know that this is sin, God has said don't do it. But you still say, even though God has said it, Jesus, I love you, but I'm going to do it. There's all out there. That is a fake love. That is not responding to the love of God. So David was very obedient. Look at him after he knows his sins. He's so humble, crushed in the heart. That's why the psalm says, a humble and contrite heart, God, you will never reject. God never rejected him. God is not going to reject you. I said earlier, God is not interested in your history. If history is to count, some of us would never stand here to preach. Some of us were horrible. I've always told you that I used to drink beer. I could even drink a crate of beer and whiskeys. I was such a drunkard. I was a slave of the dream and fornication. A slave. But today I want to tell you that uh, I'm no longer thirsty of the drink. I'm thirsty of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And I don't feel the trust anymore. And I used to say with my own words, if I stop drinking, I die. That was not me, it was a demon speaking in me. I hear people in Zambia, they say, you know, drinking is in our gene. It's in our head. Eh? You know, remember that lady time? <coughs> she used to drink a saying that it is in our blood. And then she stopped. I, I'm not here to tell you to stop drinking. That's not my work. Because drinking is not sin, the Bible says. Drinking is not sin, but getting drunk is sin. Drinking is not sin. You can show me in the Bible where the Bible says drinking is sin. Drinking is not sin, but getting drunk is sin. The only problem is the line between the drink and the drunk is so thin. When you take two bottles and you are very well behaved, but after two bottles, you start closing your eyes to women, you're already drunk. <laughs> You're already drunk because you're not normal. You're not yourself. That is why you've gotten some guts to sin. Some guts to jump the boundary because you've taken something. You're not yourself. You're drunk. And if you die drunk, the Bible says drunkards will go to hell. It is in the Bible in black and white. Galatians chapter 5, only from verse 16. Drunkards is among those who are going to hell. And by the way, Africans, why do Africans, I mean, most Africans, why do we drink? To get drunk. So we drink to sin. That is right. We drink to sin. At least some of the Bazungus, they, they, can, they have self-control, a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Somebody can take a glass of wine and, for us. <laughs> <laughs> Competition. I don't know you're competing. Are you competing with the devil? Competition. <laughs> It is no longer just to enjoy the drink. It is to get drunk. So you are drinking to commit sin so that you can go to hell. It 
it's a choice. Continue drinking. <laughs> For me, let me get drunk with the Holy Spirit. That is enough. Peer pressure. We are drinking because of people. So that you can fit in the class. Let me be in the class of God. Amen. Now, you ask yourself, if when God was calling Samuel somewhere, if Samuel was drunk, how do you answer? <laughs> Samuel, Samuel. Oh, yes, God. <laughs> How do you have answered? <laughs> Would God have given him the mission? No. no. That's my sister. What about it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to have a drink. <laughs> God is good. All the time. So if you really want your heart to be the heart of God, there is a price. There are some things that you have to let go. There are some friends that you just let go say, for now, let me pull away so that I become strong in the faith, then I'll pull you from that ditch you're in. You're not leaving them because you hate them. You'll come back for them when you're stronger. But right now they'll pull you down, so you pull away. You pull away. Choose your company ways. And be obedient, be obedient like in David. Jesus, you know, two of the heavenly greatest virtues Two virtues that are greatest in heaven, in my little understanding, I've really shared in my book, No Reason for Division. Two of the greatest heavenly virtues is humility and obedience. Those are two of the greatest heavenly virtues. Jesus, the Philippians, like I said earlier, was so humble and obeyed, even obeyed death unto the cross. And for that reason, because of those two virtues, he was given the name above all names. If you want God to lift you highest, be humblest and obedient. God will lift you higher. Your heart will be close to the sacred heart of Jesus. Humility and obedience. And that is what you find difficult to do. We think that when you are humble, you are weak. No, Moses was the humblest, but he was very principled and strong. Humility is an inner strength. It's an inner strength. The sacred heart of Jesus. I want you to figure out your salvation and my salvation. And as I'm describing our salvation, and especially the Calvary journey, the last part, I want you to see the heart of God. And if you truly want to be like Christ, as I'm explaining this journey, be praying for those graces. God says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And when I'm describing this journey, I want to see you to see that God is doing it for you personally. Even if you're the only person in the world, Jesus would have still gone to Calvary. For you. That is how much he loves you. I want you to see the love of God and decide today how do you want to respond to it? Do you want to love as Jesus love? That's a question you're asking yourself. You know, people tell you I love you, I love you, and it is fake. It is last. It is I want your body to use it. And after I release, finish with you. I go for another, another one. That's all men do. And now these women in Kenya have become worse men. Is that women are good? Though? In Kenya, women are telling men, you think you know, you will know you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you find a wife is actually having three other boyfriends outside. Oh. Yeah. Now they <coughs> we are living in horrible times. Yeah. And that time when you have other partners, you think you're so wise. I've not been caught. <laughs> and the heavenly CCTV is just watching. <laughs> Whatever you're going, looking at you doing that thing, God is saying, Is this my daughter? Or <laughs> Look at Jesus. I want us to travel the Calvary journey together for a few minutes. And then we are praying with it. This is part of the prayer. The world of God is already healing. And I know God is ministering to us in a mighty way. I want you to see Jesus. When Pilate, when the leadership, when the high priests are condemning to death, 
condemning him to death. And Jesus is put thorns on his head. Remember the soldiers, how they beat him. If you have ever watched the movie Passion of Christ, you know what I'm talking about. They have beaten him like a dog. He's bleeding all over. They are saluting him and mocking him. And all this is suffering so that you can be saved. So that I can be saved. Why is he suffering? Because of your sins and my sins. And then today, I'm continuing to see, in essence, what the soldiers were doing today I'm the soldier of today. What do I do to Jesus? I am doing it through my sins today. Because the purpose of which went through this, I'm still doing the same things. And I'm justified. I'm human. Everybody's doing it. I keep reminding people, you're not everybody. After being beaten like a dog, left for the dead, with a crown of thorns, the thorns are pricking him, blood is coming from his head, and his entire body. But his heart is still for you and me. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, perseverance, that is the heart of God. He comes out and uh, Pilate is saying, look at the man. Thinking that they will be content. And who are these who are not content? The ones he's coming to save, you and me. Crucify him. Crucify him. What has he done? He's done nothing. Crucify him. The one who's coming to save us, we want to crucify him. And we are still crucifying him with our sinful life today. And we are very comfortable. We don't care. He takes a heavy cross of your sins and my sins. They are still beating him, spitting on him. Can you imagine somebody spitting on your face? I don't know how many of us here somebody has ever spat on your face. And if you have ever been that bad, how did you hear? <laughs> If somebody was to speak to you on your face now, <laughs> right, we would actually see the Islam. <laughs> Is that the sacred heart of God? <laughs> they are speaking, and his God is able to say, Fire come, destroy them. Nowadays, we even call fire to destroy others. In the name of Jesus, fire back to the sender. <laughs> <We are destroyed. laughs> God is merciful on you. You cannot be merciful on your enemies. You are even sending fire to destroy. That's a very evil prayer that people are using everywhere. We talked about it the other day. Let me not go back to that prayer. But you've been using it that an Christian prayer. Those are creation of people's imaginations. Jesus says, love your enemy and do good to them. He does not say condemn them. He does not say destroy them. <laughs> He's carrying the cross. They are beating him. They are spitting on him. The soldiers are mocking him. They are abusing him. But the heart says, My father sent me. I must fulfill. No wonder the Bible says, as regards to sin, we have not fought against sin to the extent of shedding blood. We have not. We have not fought against sin to the extent of shedding blood, but we are ready to shed blood for money. <laughs> we are ready to kill for money, but not holiness. He falls down the first time, and when he's down, they are still beating and blood is coming out from his whole body. And when he's down, he looks up to the Father, the heart, the purpose, I must rise up and continue because I love the Zambians. 
He goes on, fall down the second time. He still comes up and says, I must complete this journey because love is about sacrifice. This is the purpose for which I left heaven to come and save these souls so that they can be transformed and be another Christ with the sacred heart of Christ joined to their hearts. Three times he falls. Three times he rises. You could have fallen a thousand times like we say on the way of the cross. But the most important thing is not about the falling. What do you do after falling? Is the rising up and saying, Lord, here I am. I have learned my lesson. I'm ready to forego the past and pursue with you eternity. Even today, God is giving you another chance. He's giving me another chance. Today, he's giving us another chance of rising up again. We could have fallen in fornication, in adultery, in fear, in anger, in jealousy, in witchcraft, in whatever thing you've been doing, bribery. But today you can say, Lord, I'm rising up. Like Mary Magdalene the prostitute, I want to be the blessed of God for me. You can decide, or you can decide not to. So today it can be music in the ear, here, it goes out, or you can decide it enters and goes into your heart. He's at the door knocking. Whoever hears my voice and opens their heart, I will enter. God wants to enter. God wants to live in you. Your body is his temple. He wants, if only you allow him, he wants to live in you. So that your heart and the sacred heart can meet. And those promises, the 12 promises of the novel of the sacred heart of Jesus can be fulfilled in our lives. Healing, deliverances, blessings, protection, curses, breaking, all those things. They are all in that package. You know, eventually after beating him like a dog, falling down, rising three times, they decide to remove his clothes. That time the wounds are all over. They remove the clothes and all the wounds are opening. Blood is peeling. My sins and your sins. He remains naked, naked, naked. You know, one day I was describing about how Jesus was naked. And uh, I remember inviting a small boy. He was putting on a nice t-shirt. And the boy came to the front. Then I invited a gentleman who had a nice tie and a nice shirt. And the man came to the front with a nice public opinion. Eh? What do you call this? We call it public opinion. <laughs> The man came and stood there, and the young boy is here. Then I told the young boy, young boy, remove your t-shirt. He did not even ask me a question. Just removed and even gave it to me. I did not, no, no, remove your t-shirt. Then I looked at the man and said, man, remove your shirt. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the man looks at me. And then he looked down. I asked him, did you hear me? Yes, I heard you. What did I say? Remove your shirt. And what are you waiting for? You think I'm crazy? <laughs> Why? He said, am I crazy to remove my clothes in front of women and children? That's about 200. Yeah. I say, I did not say remove your trousers. I said remove your shirt. He said he can't. I asked him why. He said it is humiliating to remove my clothes in front of women and children. It is humiliating. But in the Lord's name, it is not humiliating. <laughs> in the guest house, it is not humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine a man cannot remove his shirt in front of 200 people, but yet your master. Your savior was humiliated, removed all the clothing, remained naked. Not even a panty. It is we who feel shameful 
and he put some clothing there. There was no clothing. Jesus was not, there was no clothing. We feel ashamed, we. But in the guest house, we are not ashamed. We put a clothing there to cover his nakedness. One day I asked a priest, how come Jesus was not ashamed? To be in the whole world watching him. Not 200 people, the whole world. And the priest told me he was not ashamed because he had no sin. Sin brings shame. Adam and Eve, before sinning, they were living naked and there was no problem. But when they committed sin, they started putting some leaves. How many days would the leaves have lasted? <laughs> they would have tried the following day. You can imagine if you have to leave the leaves. Every day you'll be looking for clothes, going for more leaves. The trees will be finished. <laughs> God had to kill an animal and make them hide. Using the hide skin. Can you imagine? You've just wronged him, then he makes you a cloak. To help you cover what you want to cover. Such an amazing hat. So this man refused to remove. But Jesus remained naked. Isaiah 53 from verse 1 and following. We are told why he had to go through this. He was humiliated to take your humiliation. He suffered pain to take your pain. By his stripe we are healed. If only we adhere to the purpose for which he suffered. After removing every cloth, humiliating him, they put him on a cross. Naked on the cross. They take, I don't know, six inches nail. Huge hammer. Every moment that you're committing sin, see yourself as that soldier who had the hammer. And I want you as you're committing sin from today, I'm asking God for you to be hearing that pain. And when you hear that pain, tell that man, let me go back to Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine my sins are actually putting the nails on Jesus today? And you keep saying, those soldiers were merciless. Tell your neighbor, don't be merciless also. Don't be merciless. <laughs> every nail, every seed now is another day on Jesus. Today. Not that time. Today. If you apply to commit a sin tonight, no, you are going to put another nail. And you are the one holding that hammer. You can imagine the pain. And then nailed on the cross, they lift him high, hanging on nails. How painful. How painful that when Jesus does like this, it is a nail holding. You can imagine the pain of your salvation, of my salvation. This is all love unto death. Loving him without measure. The soldier comes with a spear. He puts the spear on his side. Into his heart. The sacred heart you're talking about today is the culmination of the passion of Christ. Passion for what? Passion for your soul and my soul. Passion that I don't perish but have everlasting life. He cares that much for you and for me. Do I care for myself is the question. Do you care for yourself? He cares to the extent of the heart is pierced, blood comes out, and water. Let me tell you this. If you are pricked here and blood is coming out from your body, you will never see water unless and until the last drop of blood is finished. Because if the water mixes with the blood, it becomes what? Blood. So for water to come out from the heart of 
Jesus. For water to come out from the sacred heart of Jesus, the waters of baptism, the sacrament of the child, for them to come out from the heart, it means that every drop of blood in the body of Jesus was out. The last drop, then water followed. The Bible tells us that blood is life. So what this word is telling us, that Jesus gave every bit of his life. There is nothing left to save you if you cannot be saved by the blood of Jesus. Absolutely nothing. He gave his all, the last drop, until water followed. <coughs> that is how much he loves you. That is the sacred heart. That is the agonizing Jesus. That is the suffering Jesus who is still suffering today because that which caused the last drop of blood to, to come out is still happening in your life and my life today. See. So the question is, I always ask how many people love Jesus and I see all the hands going up. Today I wanted to ask yourself sincerely, do you really love him? If sin is causing him this, and I'm continuing to sin, do I really love him? That is a question today. How do I reciprocate to the love of God? How do I reciprocate? How do I respond to this sacred heart, this merciful heart, this dying heart for me? How do I respond to that amazing, enormous love? Is a question. Do I have a heart like his? Do I want to have a heart like his? Do I want to be a man, a woman, a lady, a young man, youth, child, after God's heart like David? David is a human being. He shows us the way. Sincere repentance and changing. Never to go back to our own ways and ways. That is the only way to respond, okay, to respond to the love of God. That is the only way to love as Christ loves us. Love is about sacrifice. To be ready to die for the cause as Christ has died for you and me. <clears throat> like Daniel in the lion's den. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Like Susanna, who is being killed. Is being, she's going to be stoned because she has refused to sleep with the two judges. She said, I'd rather die, but not commit adultery. For us, it's easier to commit adultery than even go to prison. Is that how we love Jesus? I want you to stand. If you want the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, to lead us to all the truth. Leading us to all the truth means helping us to remove untruths so that our heart can become like the sacred heart of Jesus. Jesus himself is the truth. So we are talking about his heart, we are talking about the truth. And you can only get to that when you hear the word of God and obey. Hear the word of God and obey. Hear the word of God and obey. That means there are many things you have to drop, I have to drop, for my heart to be like the sacred heart. For the spirit of God to come and indwell in me. I have to reciprocate to this love. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to attempt to measure for me, to measure based on what you've heard about the love of God. How much do you think God loves you? Do you think he loves you this small, or big, 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 big? Measure for me, how much does God love you? Try and measure. How much? If you measure, you continue. How much does he love you? From what you have. You don't even have to try. How much does he love you? Can you measure? No. You cannot measure. It is too much. Too much. Too much. Your excess love. Jesus, you love me so much. We cannot make
Asia, the land of I wanted to ask a specific question. I want you to measure for me, and listen before you do it. I want you to measure for me how much you love Jesus, not based on your words, but your actions before coming here today. How much did you love him? I know some people don't want to do like this. <laughs> we love him so small compared to how much he loves us. Do you think that is being fair to God? No. So what must we do? Change. Be like King David. Sincere repentance and a change of heart. He says, recreate in me a new heart and a new spirit. That is what you want to pray for today. That's what you want to pray for today. A new heart. God can recreate if you want. He does not force. It is you who is going to see, can I really say no to sin? Can I say no to that man, to that woman? Can I say no to that boss? Can I say, even if I'm going to sleep angry, let me die of hunger, but not sell my body. The temple of the Holy Spirit, who's going to help me to have a heart like Jesus. So I want us to go into a repentance session. Each will talk to God. That is still part of the religion, so that the Holy Spirit can come and take his place in our lives. The ones who are elderly can sit down. The ones who can kneel down can kneel down. It's a sign of humility. You know, when Jesus is mentioned, every knee bows in heaven on earth and under the earth. The ones who can kneel down is okay. Even the old man who wants to kneel down, let him kneel. But the ones who cannot, that is a sign of if you're not very old and you can kneel down, kneel down. don't worry about that in your clothes. What is your clothes compared to the suffering that Jesus is going through? Even if you are sick, you might be surprised when you are kneeling down. God sees the humility answers your prayer. You might be surprised. But if you are totally sick, you can't. It's okay. It is okay. God, God is God. He understands you and He knows your condition. But close your eyes. If you, if you can. Again, it's not a mask. Closing the eyes only helps you. In your heart, talk to God. David talks to God. David talks to God. David sincerely repented. David poured his out to God. David cried to God. Talk to God. In your heart, if you want to speak it out, it's okay. It's all about your neighbor. It's about you and God. Sincerely cry to God. Promise him to change your life. Promise him to fix your life. Our lives are a mess. Have mercy on us, God. We have really wronged God. We have crucified him every day of our lives. Jesus is on the road to Calvary every day because of my sins. Because of your sins. And you want the spirit of truth to come. Where will he come? He is the spirit of truth. We want him to heal us. How is he going to heal us when you are nailing him every day? When you are committing sin, no willingly and you don't care. Praise. Arrogance. God is interested in humble hearts. God is interested in people who hear the word and they work on themselves. They allow the word to work in them. He says, I will never reject a contrite heart, a humble heart, a broken heart. I will never, God will never reject you. You can only reject yourself, but God will never reject you. He wants to embrace you once more like the prodigal son. But he cannot force himself unto you. The prodigal son had to get back to his senses. He went back to his father. And the Father was running for him. Even right now, you can come back in the spirits. 
It's not about physical coming back. It's about spiritual coming back. Returning to the Father. The Father's been waiting for you. The Father's been waiting for me. He wants us to come back. Are you ready to come back? The Lord is asking. In your hand, tell him if you're ready. In your hand, start coming back. Come back to the Lord. The sacred of the God is suffering for you and for me. He's suffering so that we return to him. He wants to embrace you like the prodigal sons. Allow him to embrace you. As you are repenting, just like the prodigal son, when you're telling the father, I have wronged you, I have wronged the father in heaven. The father did not listen. He told the workers, quickly wash him. May the Lord today tell the angels, command the angels to wash you anew with the blood of the Lamb, to make you new again, to put a new garment on you, to refresh you from eating with the peace. We are suffering in the world. But the kingdom of God is full of goodies. God can even say right now, how many jobs will have me? You are married, be blessed, to be blessed. Your children stop drinking and addiction, and they will be delivered. God is able to speak a word into your situation. But are we ready to come back to him? Are we ready the heart of God to meet with our heart, to make us new again? Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Pour your heart unto God. Pour your heart. If you feel like crying, cry. It's okay. We have wronged God. We have messed with our bodies. Instead of being the temple of God, it has become the place of prostitution, fornication, adultery is no more. Our bodies have become, I don't know what, God has messed on us. The world has become so darkened and we are so okay with it. We are crucifying Jesus every day. We are taking to Calvary every day. God is not happy with the present world. Let's not cheat ourselves. The heart of God, the sacrament of Jesus is crying blood. May that blood wash you. May that blood wash me. May the blood wash us. May the blood of Jesus deliver us. From the sacred heart came blood and water, the waters of baptism, the sacraments of the church. May they deliver us once more. They are all for our salvation. Have you been the only person in the world? Jesus has still died for you. He loves you that dearly. How do you reciprocate to this love of God? We want to receive his spirit. How can we receive when the temple is not ready? God wants to live in you and me. Are we ready? Tell him you're ready. Promise him to change your life. Talk to God yourself. Some things is not about being prayed for. Some things you pray for yourself. The decision is yours solely. Tell God. Promise him to change your life. Fix your life by his grace. The grace is sufficient. On the cross, Jesus gave up the Spirit so that we can receive the Spirit, so we can receive the grace, the grace to help us to remain in this salvation journey. Continue surrendering to God. Continue talking to Him. Continue repenting sincerely. Promise Him to make amends. A contrite heart, a broken heart, a humble heart, God will never reject. God is here for you. God is here for me. He wants to live in you. He wants to live in me. Are you ready to receive him? Are you ready to respond to the love of God? Jesus Christ have mercy on us. 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 Jesus Christ have mercy on us.
May our bodies be your true temple from today on. Amen. We invite him in your heart. He's at the door of He says, Ask and you shall see. If you want me to come and tell him, tell him yourself that you want him in your heart. You tell him. He does not force. If you really want to invite him into your heart, if you really want to invite him into your heart, he does not force. It's whereby he says, Whoever hears my knock, my voice, and opens the door of their heart, I will come in. He wants to come in and live in you. Invite him into your heart. He does not force his way. Allow him in. The Lord continue to touch you and heal you. Deliver you and protect you. Bless you. I wish to sincerely thank you for your continued viewership of this uh, YouTube channel, Steve Wayesu, and to continue receiving uh, the teachings as they are released. You may subscribe to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and also ensure to click on the notification bell so that every time a new teaching is uh, released, you get a message on your, on your phone. We are continuing with our 12 part series of Redigging the Wells of Anointing every Saturday. And if you miss any one of these teachings on a Saturday, remember you'll be able to get them on the, on the, on the YouTube channel. I also want to remind you that my books are now available online on Amazon.com. You can use the www.amazon.com forward slash author forward slash Steve Wayesu. And you can get my books, ebooks, paperback, and even hardcover books. From the first book, Solace in Sorrow, My 17 Years of Suffering, Two Surgeries, Losing Memory, could not walk, could not see, could not stand at some point in time. How doctors were defeated the whole country. I was left for the dead. And how the Lord Jesus lifted me from down there, healed me, and called me today to turn me from a, an economist into an author, international evangelist, motivational speaker, part-time lecturer, and a number of other things that I'm doing. Also, my book, No Reason for Division, an amazing book that will show you that uh, Divisions are not from God. God wants us to be one. Be it division from marriage, family, community, 
in the church, in nations, in the world. They don't come from God. God wants us to be one. When you see divisions basically out of our weaknesses as human beings, or the devil is somewhere nurturing and bringing up divisions in our families. It's an amazing book with amazing information. Uh, also my book, Maturing in the Holy Spirit, Nine Steps of Maturing. No one wants to remain a spiritual baby. You'll not be happy when a child goes to grade one, for example, and the following year repeating grade one, the other year grade one, the next year grade one. You'll be worried as a parent. The same thing with God. When we remain spiritual dwarfs, God is not happy. He wants us to grow to the next level. These books are available online. Get a copy for yourself. As we continue receiving the teachings on this YouTube channel, meet you in the next teaching, and may God bless you so much. Bye-bye.